G'day chaps, tis I, Clampuncher139. It's hardly an unpopular opinion to have at this point, but I have come to adore Arkham Origins. At this point, it's pretty much tied with Arkham City for my favorite in the saga. I know, blasphemous speech eight years ago, but nowadays it's pretty widely accepted. Arkham Origins is a damn good game. That said, that doesn't mean it doesn't have its fair share of problems. This is everything actually wrong with Batman Arkham Origins, since sin channels never seem to get it right. You all probably know the drill by now, so let's just get right to it. Uh, come on, Crane, is that you again? I thought I got rid of you. Apparently, I haven't been taking enough advantage of the sponsor of this video, Atlas VPN, to get rid of him. At this point, everyone needs a VPN in their lives, and right now, Atlas is running a huge discount. If you click the link in the description or pinned comment, you can get a 3-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Malicious links and ads are found aplenty online, but Atlas will outright block them from your computer and even alert you if someone tries to steal your data. And it even stops Google and other search engines from tracking you, giving you real organic search results not corrupted by ads. Sometimes your favorite show is on a certain streaming service, but the company just decided it's region locked from your country. With Atlas, you can change your location to somewhere it is available. And speaking of streaming services, Atlas helps you save money if you feel the need to sign up for every single one. Just find the country with the cheapest subscription rate and sign up there. It's not even exclusive to streaming, you can get cheaper flights, hotels, and more. It's basically free money just waiting to get back in your pockets. And best of all, you can get Atlas to protect all of your devices with only a single subscription. With scary computer hacking villains out to steal your data on a daily basis, there has never been a better time to try out Atlas VPN. Once again, click the link in the description or pinned comment to get started with a 3 year subscription of Atlas VPN for just $1.99 a month. And if you aren't satisfied, you've got a money back guarantee for a full 30 days. Big thanks to Atlas for sponsoring, now let's get to our origins problems. If Crane would just leave me alone for once! Seriously dude, your video is next week! Have a little patience. Just like I did with Arkham Knight, let's get the big obvious problem out of the way right now. The Joker. There's no denying facts. WB Montreal basically lied to us about the main story of this game. All the advertising and the entire first third of the game is dedicated to building up Black Mask as the main antagonist, with no sign of the Joker anywhere. That was a big relief at the time, because we'd gone two games in a row with Joker as our main villain, and he literally died at the end of the last one. We needed to give the clown a rest. And at first, it seemed like we were getting just that, for basically the entire game's advertising campaign and the first few hours of gameplay. But then, we all know where everything got derailed. Lazy Towers. Batman goes about reading the text to Black Mask, and then we hear the ever-present name. The Joker. And honestly, it's a major cop-out that the writers took. We spent the last multiple months hyping ourselves up for Batman having to take down one of the most notorious crime bosses, Black Mask, and then that's just dropped in favor of bringing back the Joker. Don't get me wrong, what we ultimately got is amazing. Every scene between this Batman and Joker is absolutely stunning, rivaling even the best between Conroy and Hamill or Bale and Ledger. They're that good. But the thing is that we don't really know if we needed it. Yes, in the scope of the overall saga, it makes sense for this to be another Batman-Joker game. The Arkham franchise is about their relationship. But if Origins had gone another direction, would it really have had to be? If Origins had decided to really stick to their guns and focus on the Black Mask and Eight Assassins storyline, we could have gotten a much more compelling story of Batman against Bane. Now, obviously, mainstream audiences just saw that matchup merely a year prior in The Dark Knight Rises, which in my humble opinion was pretty amazing, fight me. However, we could have gotten an even better adaptation in this game. What we have is no doubt great, I love Bane and Batman's confrontations, but it could have been a lot more. And more importantly, abandoning Joker in City where he literally died could have meant Rocksteady didn't need to double down and include him in Night. Now, that may have been their plan from the start, but there's always that chance that if Montreal didn't include Joker, Rocksteady wouldn't have either after they finished his story. Again, I love Joker, and every scene with him, both in this game and every other, is a masterpiece. 
but he was just unnecessary in Arkham Origins. And honestly, taking him out of the story leaves us with a lot still intact. Think about if we got this story focusing on Black Mask. Everything is pretty much the same up until the Lacey Towers case. Instead of someone trying to overthrow him, he fakes his own death, and sent Penguin to the location to frame him for his murder. He does this to get Cobblepot out of his hair, since he's an up-and-coming crime boss about to take his position as the most powerful man in Gotham. He would even kill his supposed girlfriend because power is just that important to him. He sent the assassins after Batman not because he's interested in him like Joker, but because he wants to get the Bat out of Gotham, and show that he's willing to get things done to keep people in line, no matter the cost. Then things would stay mostly the same up until the GCPD. Now it's Black Mask overthrowing the cops instead of Joker, which I could see being excused by him being disappointed in the cops' lackluster performance to get rid of the Batman. He's already unimpressed with Loeb's performance, as seen in the interview tapes, so taking action and overthrowing them would be pretty understandable. When Batman gets to the National Criminal Database, he would find out that Black Mask faked his death, and even murdered his own henchmen to cover it up, rather than discovering Joker. And here's where we'd have the first major deviation. Black Mask wouldn't steal from his own bank. In fact, why would he steal from any bank? He's the boss, he wouldn't steal from someone else's bank when he can just get his lackeys to do it. So, we'll instead have this be a trap. Roman will realize Batman is starting to catch on to his fake death, so set a trap at the bank the same way Joker accessed it, with his biometrics. It isn't too far-fetched to believe Sionis could learn how smart Batman is and set a trap only he could find out about. Now, instead of confronting Joker, Batman confronts Black Mask with the addition of an assassin. And what better assassin than the one that already fights you in the bank? Deadshot! We can even have a similar setup to the Joker reveal. The two confront in the vault, Black Mask tries blowing Batman up in an attempt to save himself 50 million, but fails as he escapes. This leaves Deadshot, who had been trailing Batman as he entered the bank. He enters as the bomb explodes, and now we have a boss fight that doesn't require a side quest. And if you think all this is convoluted, look at the series you're saying that about. This whole series is convoluted, so all this happening is really not that bizarre. Now we'd have even more reason to go to the steel mill, sent its own by Sionis. Where better to find him than his own hideout? And pretty much all of it could play out the same up until we're supposed to meet the mutinied Sionis. At this point, have it still be Sionis, just not mutinied against. He could be casually sitting in a chair, drinking a glass of whiskey as he waits for Batman to show up, knowing that Copperhead was close behind to jump in for the kill. Then, Copperhead plays out the same, and Sionis could still call for the meeting for the assassins in the Gotham Royal. And at that point, it would still make sense to call a meeting, because either Copperhead would have succeeded and the hit would be called off, or four of his assassins would have already been defeated by Batman, five if you count Electrocutioner's humiliation, and they need to step up their game. He could still make a message out of killing Electrocutioner just as Joker did, especially because he technically already failed. Then the rest of the Gotham Royal arc could play out as normal, just without all the festive updates Joker gave it. I admit that not having Joker talking us through the hotel would really take away from its memorability, and obviously take away the whole funhouse section, but I think it could still work for the most part. Bane staying behind would work just fine, and would only require a small change in the cutscene department. We could even still have the bomb set up to show just how unhinged Black Mask is compared to the other mob bosses, and giving him a monologue to Batman would still work great. I don't think blowing up the building would be necessary, as him just monologuing to Batman would be enough. Maybe throw in some of the torture we see him known for for good measure, like sticking a knife in Batman as he lays on the ground. I, mean, I don't know, something to just make him seem really unhinged, which he is. Then Bane would come in as normal and the fight would play out as intended. After the fight, we can even do the saving jump from the base game, but with an added twist. Rather than holding Batman at gunpoint, he would look at what Batman did with respect. He'd tell his guys to put their weapons down and surrender. He goes to Blackgate willingly. And most of the rest of the game could play out pretty much the same, just cutting out the killing joke stuff. Everything with Bane and Firefly would be identical since it doesn't even involve Joker to begin with. Alfred could still die and then Black Mask could still incite the riot at Blackgate. 
It would show how much power he still has that he was able to bribe some guards into getting him out and bringing the whole prison under his control for the second time in the night. Now the inmates' goals aren't to kill Batman, just to escape. Bane wouldn't be working with Joker here, or even Black Mask for that matter. Sionis could just be out of this entire arc, all things considered. He could just be waiting in the warden's office while all this plays out. Bane could still fight us in the Panopticon, just without the crowd of inmates or the risk of the heartbeat monitor. I will admit one thing this change does take away is Batman choosing to team up with Gordon and Joseph, which was a big part of his character arc as discussed in one amazing scene. But I'm sure they could find a way to incorporate it here as well. Batman would confront Sionis in the Warden's office, and instead of going all gung-ho fist blazing like he has the rest of the game, he would be calm and just talk it out with the boss. In essence, creating another character arc for Batman where he doesn't need to be so mercilessly violent. Sionis would call the hit off, the prison would be brought under control, and the story would come to an end. Now I'm not a professional story writer by any means, but doesn't that sound at least kind of engaging even without the Joker? Joker isn't necessary for Batman's character arc in this game, and I only needed to make a few significant changes to the plot to make it about Black Mask instead. I'm not saying it's a perfect story by any means, and I'm sure you're all gonna critique it a lot in the comments. But the point I'm making is that it's possible. It's possible to do this story without the Joker and make it just as, if not more, effective. Again, I love Joker and think he's amazing in this game. But this just goes to show that in the end, the writers were really leaning on this crutch. So do you have anything else to contribute? I didn't think so. <laughs> This game is ridiculously incomplete. There is no denying it. I know a lot of you supposedly have never had stupid glitches in night. I don't know how, but I guess I'll believe you. But there is no way anyone has played Origins and not come across some kind of glitch. This game is absolutely riddled with weird bugs, soft locks, and unexplainable glitches. Every single time I've played Origins, I've found a weird bug like this encounter with Copperhead, or experienced a softlock like this infinite white screen against Bane. Hell, the very first time I played it nine years ago, I had a glitch in Cold Cold Heart where an enemy glitched into a wall and ended up falling into the void, preventing me from progressing. And you can't deny you've seen some of these glitches yourself. Origins is simply incomplete. It needed just a few more months with QA testing to iron out these kinks that it simply didn't get. Now I understand why these glitches are so plentiful. WB Montreal was an inexperienced studio making a game larger than Arkham City in the time it took to make Asylum. It makes sense they couldn't iron everything out and meet the deadline with how much they put into this game. And at this point, I've just come to accept these glitches as part of Origin's personality. It's fun to see what new bug you'll run into on the next playthrough, or if you'll somehow trigger one again. But that doesn't mean it's not poor management that shouldn't be criticized. They should have just taken the L and released the game a few months later. Help, maybe released it actually during Christmas time to correspond with the game's setting? It would have been fine is what I'm saying. And aside from the glitches, there's another aspect that's pretty unpolished in this game, the cutscenes. While the CG cutscenes look great, better than anything else in the entire saga, the in-engine ones are... really scuffed, to say the least. Characters just look... so unnatural. Their lips are disturbingly prominent and active, creating a severe dip into the uncanny valley, and their movements are just really janky at worst, and really stiff at best. Compare this to Arkham Asylum and City, where all the characters felt a lot more natural talking to Batman, and most importantly, their lips moved like actual humans. Hell, Batman himself moves a lot more naturally in City and Asylum, even though all three games are using the same basic head movements. I don't know what it is, but the previous Batman felt a lot more alive, and it's not just because of the lips. It's just another case of the team being really rushed and being unable to polish their work. I can't really blame them for that, but I can blame the higher-ups for not letting them finish. I don't really know if I should blame the game too hard for this, but it's worth bringing up the retcon it made to Joker and Harley. If you don't know, in Arkham Asylum, it's shown in an interview tape that the two met in the Asylum. 
Harley interviewed for the position of psychiatrist, and eventually Joker became her first patient to evaluate. Harley later helped Joker escape Arkham and became Heart Harley Quinn persona. Now, Origins has created an entirely new origin story for the two, implying that they met in Blackgate. Not only that, but that Harley was responsible for him breaking out and later fully became Harley Quinn sometime before Origins Online. In case you didn't know, yes, she does make an appearance in that mode whenever Joker enters the arena. This would mean the tapes in Asylum are now non-canon, or Origins as a whole is non-canon. Either way, it's definitely a problem. I can't harp on the game too hard though because the scene we got with the two is really amazing. It's a great way to bring in the Killing Joke storyline and get Joker and Harley together, even if it does break established continuity. But it does break established continuity, so I do have to call it a sin. At one point I saw someone try to explain how it could fit in canon with the Asylum tapes just being role plays between the two to reminisce about their first meeting. Unfortunately, that just doesn't seem possible because Harley's first tape is her interview to work at the Arkham. And if she became Harley Quinn in the time between Origins and Asylum, aka Origins Online, there is no way she'd be able to land a gig at Arkham. It just does not make sense, so yeah, I have to call it a sin. The Concussion Detonator is the worst gadget in the entire series. Aside from two very niche scenarios, it is completely useless. All it does is disorient a few enemies, but it's terrible because it makes them start swinging. True, they can hit their buddies like they could when shocked with the wreck gun, but they can also hit you. The wreck gun had its uses aside from stunning enemies. It made armed guys shoot, disrupted electronics, and made weapon wielders hit their buddies. The concussion detonator does none of that. The only time it's useful is against Copperhead and Firefly. Against Copperhead, it will instantly down one of her clones, but they still go down in one critical strike on lower difficulties anyway, so it's not that impressive. Against Firefly, it will instantly stun him, allowing you to use the back claw whenever you want. This is the most useful aspect, but you know, you also have to hit him, which isn't exactly free. Aside from those two very specific uses, this gadget is absolutely worthless. Why the hell did Rocksteady adapt it into the quick-fire explosive gel for Arkham Knight when the original was so much more useful? The shock gloves are broken. Look, I love wailing on thugs with these things, but the fact of the matter is that they are so unbelievably busted that they completely take away any skill from basic combat. You just mash attack and you will hit every single enemy, no questions asked. Shields, sun six, and armor, things specifically designed so you can't win every encounter by just punching? Irrelevant. Bruce designed to take lots of damage? Reduced to ashes in seconds with a few shock pounds. The final boss of Bane? Literally a joke because you get unlimited shocking power for phase two. It takes away basically all skill except timing when you attack so you don't hit a grounded foe. That's all you have to do when you get the shock gloves powered up. Again, they're fun, but they're so unbelievably brain dead that I do my best to not even use them unless the encounter is nearly impossible without them. AKA, almost all of the final encounters in Blackgate. The map sucks. Now, I'm not harping on their reuse of Arkham City's map. I'm honestly pretty fine with that, especially with all the cleaning up they did to make it look brand spanking new. It honestly feels like a new map half the time, I can dig it. And New Gotham is pretty great too. It's a bunch of towering skyscrapers filled to the brim with back alleys and secrets for you to find. It's a fun map to explore. However, there is one design choice I just cannot get behind in any way, shape, or form. The bridge. The bridge is one of the worst additions they could have made to this otherwise really great map because it completely breaks the flow of movement across the city. Batman himself says the issue with the bridge the very first time you cross it. This is a long bridge. I should use my grapnel accelerator. It's way too friggin' long. It takes upwards of a full minute just to cross this bridge, which is pretty much the amount of time it would take to cross the entirety of the other three games' maps. And it doesn't help that they literally put in fast travel points to negate this issue. 
creating a mediocre solution to a problem you created is not very good game design. I end up using fast travel so much in situations I really shouldn't have to. It should only be necessary for getting to and leaving the back cave. The map shouldn't be designed in such a way that getting from one end to the other without fast travel doesn't feel tedious. But with Arkham Origins, it does. And it all comes back to the damn bridge. I love its use during Firefly's story arc. It's an amazing set piece for what more or less acts like a finale of sorts. But it's terrible from an open world perspective. It ruins the flow of exploration and I really wish they just pushed it somewhere else. And speaking of fast travel, why did they lean so heavily into it? Why does each half of the map have three points to travel to when the initial two you get are perfect on their own? The first gets you into New Gotham, the second into Old Gotham. That's all you should need in literally any situation. Sure, it might take like half a minute to reach the other sides of the islands, but it's nowhere near as bad as crossing the bridge. It's just needless coddling in my opinion that takes away a core mechanic they introduced in Arkham City, that being the improved gliding. Now I'd probably change my mind if they let you actually fly the Batwing, as that would be an interesting take on a fast travel mechanic. But they didn't, so it won't. And that's about all I've got, chaps. That was everything actually wrong with Batman Arkham Origins. If you think I missed something truly egregious, let me know in the comments about how stupid I am. Not quite as much to complain about as Arkham Knight, but still a significant amount either way. That said, do all the YouTube stuff because Joker wants to hurt me after all that slander. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later, chaps. How many lives did you just take? None, I think. That was just a little stalking stuffer, a construction site blocking my view. <laughs>